Uh, transformative learning for Christians, methods for sharing how we make sense of things in a postmodern world. Now, the, 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 the sheet I've given you just has got the, the main sort of headings that you can follow along, and the, um, the, the references on the other side, they're not in alphabetical order, but as they come uh, as my talk goes on. So, um, if they're of use to you and you want to follow anything up, um, there we go. So, introduction then. Transformative education took off in the States in the last quarter of the 20th century. But it's important to say that the educational, psychological and philosophical ideas uh, that shape transformative education are worldwide. And they extend much further back in time. Nevertheless, it was Jack Mesiro and his associates who popularised this way of learning. And their ideas were taken up by Patricia Cranton, also in the United States, and Stephen Brookfield, who worked with the Open University in this country, but also um, has done a lot of work in the United States. Transformative education. Basically, the idea of transformative education is it's about adult learning. That's the important thing. Although some of the things I want to say this evening would refer to uh, the way that uh, uh, children and young people grow up. But basically, I'm talking about an adult educational methodology. It's about how adults, adult learners, construct, validate and reformulate the meaning of what they experience. So it's based on life experience. It's a bottom-up process rather than a top-down. Now it's called transformative because it is essentially about a process of change. So my take on it would be to say that it encourages a change from a private and individualistic uh, understanding of learning, interpretation of learning, to one that is collaborative and emancipatory from a private and individualistic understanding of learning to one that is collaborative and emancipatory and I'll spell that out as we go along. So it is perhaps misleading to call it a method because that might suggest that it consists of a particular sort of technique which you could pull out of the drawer and apply to the task in hand and hey presto you find that you are transformed. Uh, transformative learning represents really a diverse collection of ideas and it is the connectedness of various ideas that provokes change. Now some people here tonight may know that with the support and encouragement of others I constructed a three-year training course for ordained local ministers in this diocese. It was designed on transformative educational lines and it survived for 10 years until the regional training partnership took over ministerial training for the Church of England. Now I don't want to talk about that course because I want to go back uh, a stage further and talk about the essential components of transformative learning which I think you'll find much more interesting. I've got the course submission here with me if anyone's interested to see it. It was quite interesting for me to actually look at it this afternoon for the first time for years and think, gosh, did I say that? <laughs> Somehow it got, it got through um, the, 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 um, the London office, as it were, but uh, with some difficulty. Um, so, but let me just say in passing that the course was based on the experience gained from team training and it used group work throughout. The participants were identified from... Uh, local ministry teams, shared ministry teams, at that time notably from Gummel teams, the group for urban ministry and leadership, Gummel teams. And the course attempted to balance traditional theological subjects, for example, Bible, Christian belief, church history, worship and so on, with subjects that reflected contemporary experience, for example, liberation theology, faith development theory, social context, global issues. And the participants were asked to connect what they had learnt with their own experience and to share that learning experience with one another 
And so, along with that kind of shared discourse, they also kept um, a personal but not private learning journal about their learning journey. And the course had eight learning outcomes, and these were kept deliberately open-ended as much as possible in line with David Kolb's warning that the vogue for defining learning in terms of outcomes is tantamount to admission of non-learning because they prevent the modification of ideas as a result of the gained experience. We have quite a lot of difficulty with those open-ended learning outcomes. But let me turn then straight away to the essential components of transformative learning. And I've grouped them under the three domains of learning, which are the main headings that you've got on the sheet. Understanding, interpretation and application. The key to transformative learning is not to regard those domains as separate entities. This is the whole point about this movement right across the spectrum. These three main components are all mixed together. It's seeing how they connect that I believe provokes transformation. But let me just say in passing um, that it's important to note that the, word, that the Latin word, educare, which means to lead out, that gives a good clue to this kind of educational method because education understood in this way is not so much about putting inf information into somebody but how that new information connects with the learner's life experience. Ian Ramsey, who was one time Bishop of Durham, talked about what he called disclosure situations where he refers not only to information but to situations and I quote from him he talked about situations coming alive taking on depth situations in which the penny drops where we see but not with eyes of flesh where something strikes us where eye meets eye and where hearts miss a beat it is that kind of trigger experience which we get with this kind, particularly with this kind of learning method, which actually provokes the transformation. So to the first of the three domains, understanding. I want to touch on a bit of philosophy and one or two educational theories, but I see no point in wading through a load of adult education theory. So what follows isn't in any sense comprehensive, but just a selection of uh, some theories that illustrate why transformative learning is important. To start, let's note two very different ways that the ancient Greeks made sense of what they knew. Two divergent ways of understanding that are still empl em employed today. First, the rationalist or idealist approach following Parmenides, who emphasised the primacy of reason rooted in the historic consciousness of human beings. And then on the other side, the empiricist, realistic approach, following Heraclitus, who emphasised the primacy of the senses and his belief that everything is in a state of flux. So you've got a kind of a static idea and one which is very much like a river, constantly flowing. And transformative education, with its understanding of learning as the interpretation of what we experience, inevitably goes along with the latter, goes along with Heraclitus. It was Aristotle, sometime later, who distinguished the three domains of learning. He talked about technical skill, theoretical knowledge and practical wisdom, phronesis. Technical skill, theoretical knowledge and practical wisdom and that gives us our, our three categories. They've been renamed many times over, not least by the 20th century philosopher Habermas. He calls the first technical skill, he calls it instrumental learning. Theoretical knowledge he calls communicative and practical wisdom he calls emancipatory. That's where we get that third uh, understanding. 
So the first instrumental is about information, it's about facts, about the way that we accumulate data. The second, communication, communicative learning, is about how we interpret the facts, how we make sense of the information that we receive. And the third, emancipatory, is how we apply what we have learnt in the context in which we find ourselves. Now, transformative learning does not deny the importance of the first of those domains, the, the instrumental technical skill, but it does stress the need to move on through the process, because interpretation and application also matter a great deal. David Kolb, who I mentioned in terms of learning outcomes a moment ago, uh, constructed a circle to demonstrate that pro uh, process. It's often called the learning cycle or circle, or more technically, the hermeneutical cycle, the cycle of interpretation. And the idea, if you think of it as more like as a clock face with 12, 3, 6 and 9, if you start at the top, although it doesn't really matter, um, you take an experience, that's the instrumental bit, some knowledge, some new experience comes along, and then down to 3 o'clock, uh, you reflect on it. And you file it somewhere among your other mass of accumulated experience. That's the 6 o'clock, that's the interpretation bit. And then, at nine o'clock, uh, you test it. You know, what have I learnt from this? Where does it take me? That's the application bit. And then you start again with another experience, having gone full circle. But we're not simply going round and round in the same circle. It's, it's, it's a movement. It's, it's a kind of spiral. Because you have changed as a result of reflecting on your experience. The trouble is that much of what we learn stays at the instrumental level. We are pumped with facts, with technical know-how, which is tested by means of standardised and predetermined learning outcomes that measure our exit competencies. I've been there, done that, got the qualification. Education, I suggest, has become compartmentalised. It has broken up into subject areas. And in the world of ministerial training, Edward Farley in America argued that there was a time, a long time ago, when theology consisted of a practical wisdom, that idea of Aristotle, about a practical wisdom about the way we experience God in the world, not just those who were sort of trained to have some particular ministerial task, but that everyone who reflected on making sense of reality in terms of um, the trust in God. It was a kind of holistic process, but then it got broken up. What was, in his, in his description, a cognitive disposition and orientation of the soul, that holistic vision, vision was broken up into what he called strategic know-how for ministers. He believed that academic studies are perceived by students as having, quote, little or no relevance to the successful prosecution of the ministry. So, just a brief word at this stage about collaboration and sharing before I move on to interpretation. I suppose collaboration is the technical word, but sharing is probably the easier word to use. And one of the essential tasks for transform transformative learning is that the participants share their learning experiences. Instrumental learning tends to be individualistic. It's about me acquiring a certain skill or tech name. More about that later. But just for now, let me quote from a correspondence I had with a teacher at the Church Divinity School of the Pacific in Berkeley, California, who said this. In my opinion, only a minority of our students seem to understand the implications of a more shared approach to ministry. Efforts towards more collaborative training clash with competitive expectations, especially among the more academically gifted. So, moving on from 
facts from instrumental learning to interpretation, the second of my three main areas that I want to talk about, the second of the three learning domains. Let me remind you again that these three domains of learning are not discrete, they're not compartmentalised, they do not represent separate worlds. The business of all good education, especially when the aim is to change people from an individualistic to a more collaborative understanding of what they learn, requires a to and fro motion through all three of the learning domains. So under this heading of interpretation, let's focus on two powerful ideas, one from philosophy and the other from psychology. First, from the philosopher Hans-Georg Gadamer, who died in 2002, aged 102. And in his great work, Truth and Method, not an easy tone, but I remember reading it on a bus travelling to Poland, <laughs> as you do. Um, in his great work, he built a theory of interpretation based on the philosopher Heidegger's asser asser assertion that the essence of an experience cannot be separated from its cycle of interpretation. I'll say that again. The essence of an experience cannot be separated from its cycle of interpretation. In other words, there's no such thing as um, whenever we have experience that it's somehow completely separate from anything else. Life isn't like that. It's, it's, you can't separate out um, sheer facts from all that goes on around them. Uh, and that, um, Gadamer said that he, he went on to construct a model of interpretation that consisted of a to and fro movement in which both past and present experience is constantly mediated. Just unpack that a little bit. The tradition of the past, he argued, is not fixed. It's always moving because the tradition that comes to us from the past's past cannot be separated from our experience of it. If we look back to the Battle of Waterloo or whatever it may be, uh, we don't simply see that as something that happened in the past, but our experience of it and our take on it uh, also, as it were, changes the overall um, experience. The tradition of the past is not fixed, it's always moving, because the tradition itself cannot be separated from our experience of it, nor can our experience of the present be separated from what has gone before. So he argued that past and present experience is constantly fused. There is no fixed horizon, he said. Understanding is always interpretation. And you can think about this, if you like, as the consequence of a to and fro movement, say, between the text and the reader, whether you're reading a novel or scripture or whatever. Um, it's, it's the way you, in the present, respond to what has been written in the past. Or between a musical score and the listener. If you go to a concert, the music comes alive and the particular interpretation brings the music from the past into the present. Or if you go to the theatre and, and see a play, um, the way you respond to what the actors are doing on the stage lifts the, 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 the text of the play and the acting, it, it becomes part of you and you engage with it. So there's this constant to and fro, like a, like a game of tennis, if you like, uh, between the, the, the actors and the audience, between the text and you. And that results, says Gadamer, in change. Things can never be the same. And that's why he added this third element, application. He said, understanding, interpretation and application make up one unified process. Now, if we apply this to the, the Christian tradition, then we see that there can be no fixed points. Scripture and tradition are reshaped by our experience of them. 
um, as the Church of England licensing service said, or perhaps still does, I don't know, something like this, the gospel message has to be proclaimed or interpreted afresh for each generation. So that's, that's the philosophical side, this to and fro movement, this fusion of past and present experience um, and the work of Gadamer. I want now to go on to the, a, a psychological tack on this, on interpretation. Uh, I want to touch on theories of conflict resolution. But it's worthwhile to put in a quick word here about what we mean, first of all, when we talk about uh, religious faith. Um, in terms of what we understand by the term religious faith, it's worth noting Wilfred Cantwell Smith's distinction between faith and belief. Wilfred Cantwell Smith worked, I think, in the theology department at the University of Birmingham quite a long while ago now. Um, but he wrote a, a, a book called The Meaning and End of Religion. And he disting distinguished between faith and belief. Now, his understanding of belief is that over time, religion has been changed into a kind of cumulative tradition, a collection of historical constructs. And that's about believing particular things. Now, in contrast to that, he argued that faith is not like that. It relates to a dynamic experience that expresses a person's trust in and loyalty to a centre of value that that person has set their heart on. So that's, with that distinction in mind between belief and faith, and thinking now about religious faith, let's move on quickly to conflict resolution. There's no doubt that we have a great deal to learn from Sigmund Freud, and for those who have built on his insights to construct developmental stages based on the way we negotiate uh, conflict resolution. Not thinking so much of Piaget's uh, cognitive stages of a child's development, but I'm thinking of conflict resolution in the work of Eric Erickson, uh, Childhood and Society, Lawrence Kohlberg, who talked about dilemma situations, and Robert Keegan. And Robert Keegan, for example, talks about psychological development in terms of a series of renegotiated balances. And this is a process whereby we let go a previous balance in order to become part of a new whole. Now Freud, with his psychosexual theories about the projection of unresolved conflicts into adult life, took perhaps a less, less optimistic view of how we manage that process. And his ideas of how distorted projections of reality play a pr profound part in the way that we shape our understanding uh, suggested to him that God was an illusory projection of infantile need. But others have made a much more positive interpretation of how we make representations of God. Uh, there is another theory called uh, object relations theory, which is perhaps more pessimistic uh, than Freud, because whereas Freud's work was based largely on starting with the Oedipal conflict um, as, as a child grows up, um, object relations theory actually goes right back to the symbiotic union between a mother and a child and stresses the importance of the first two or three years of life in the way that the child uh, relates uh, to his or her uh, parents. And it's this second object relations theory that I want to really touch on a bit because there's some wonderful work done by uh, a woman called Anna Maria Rizzuto, I wasn't called a risotto, Anna Maria Rizzuto, who describes the process where a young child's image of God gradually becomes detached from idealised images of the parents. At first the parents are fantastic, you know, can't do a thing wrong, but as the child grows up the child becomes more aware that the parents are not absolutely perfect after all. And there comes a time when 
the, the image that the child is sort of trying to grasp uh, of God sort of shifts from the ideal parent onto a kind of God as a universal protector. And it's only at the time of puberty, says Rizzuto, that these psychological representations of God begin to yield to more cognitive notions of God. And these cognitive notions don't replace the psychological ones, but overlay them. That's a very important point. Um, a lot of work done by Donald Winnicott, who um, talked about a kind of, between the child's uh, inner kind of reflections and external reality, there was a kind of transitory, um, transitional world in, in the middle where the child created some kind of fantasy understanding of, um, of what they were experiencing. Um, and it, it's this kind of area where we construct these ideas that these um, psychological understandings of God um, arise. And Rizzuto argued that if you want to understand the religious development of an individual child, then, quote, you must have some knowledge of the private God that the child brings with him. And she says, no child arrives at the house of God without his pet God under his arm. All right? Um, and here, of course, there is always room for regression. We can regress back to more infantile understandings or we can progress. And if Freud and a lot of the object relations theory seems to be a bit depressing, then um, there are perhaps more positive ways of looking at it, which I'll come on to in a moment. Now, the idea of moving from one stage, one developmental stage to another, and I'm back now thinking about adult learning, this business of letting go in order to move on that Keegan talks about, it's been used to create what is known as faith development theory, notably by James Fowler, who worked in Atlanta in Georgia. And the idea was to identify adults at various stages of uh, faith and I think that altogether there are six stages though most people would probably not get beyond stage five because he lists as stage six people people like Jesus, Gandhi uh, and uh, others who have um, selflessly laid down their lives for others. Uh, the point is about stage development theory that attempts to line people up against one or other of those stage descriptions might seem judgmental, saying, oh, yeah, you're a stage three person, you're a stage four person. But the main point of identifying these stages is to encourage people to let go and to move on. This is Keegan's idea, the pain of letting go one stage in order to move on. Now, if Freud dwelt on the regressive nature of crisis revolution, uh, uh, resolution, uh, that, that, that when we're faced with a crisis, the temptation is to move back, and it's those things that cause complications in our adult life, then the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur actually tried to look at it positively. He said that conflict resolution doesn't always mean a return to Freud's dreamy world of lost and forbidden impulses, but it can be drawn forward into what he called a progressive sublimation that demonstrates a love for others and a concern for the well-being of society. So we may all be in, in, you know, successful or not so successful in the way that we resolve our personal conflicts, but there is always the possibility, and this is surely goes to the very heart of uh, religious faith development, that we can make a progressive um, sublimation of all those faults and failures, failures by reaching out in love for others and a concern for the well-being of society. And to understand how we can manage that painful transition in our lives uh, and construct a mature 
God representation makes available to us a massive reservoir of self-knowledge which can be used in the service of Christian ministry. And please, when I'm talking about ministry, although I do sometimes drift into the area of ordained ministry or ministry for particular tasks in the church, I'm really talking about the task of all adult Christians who reflect on uh, their life and work and recognise that they are all, all of us, called to a ministry in the church. The thing is, it's when we fail to recognise what John Hull called uncritical slumber, that Christians are prevented from breaking out of the cosy enclosure of church life, rather than daring to risk a forward-looking educational transformation that would better equip them for practical ministry. So before we move on to the third section of this talk, mention here should be made of the idea of cognitive dissonance. This is where new ideas generate a conflict with previously acquired assumptions. The necessary readjustment might be regarded as an exciting challenge or it might be regarded as a threat which needs to be blocked or reduced in some way. And Stephen Brookfield points out that to be able to admit to others that a previously held assumption now has to be modified requires a great deal of emotional courage. Thought-stopping techniques, shutting down the mind, regressing to childhood simplicity, or abandoning radical views for a safe conservatism can generate what a late friend of mine and of John Hull called religious rigidity in adults. So, um, understanding as sort of facts, the whole business of the way that we understand ourselves and the way we interpret what we learn, the second of the three domains, the last one, um, application. Gadamer's method for interpreting experience included application along with understanding and interpretation because he recognised that the constant fusion of past and present implies that things never remain the same. Now you might say, well all education aims to equip us in some way, changes us, competency in some skill or other, academic accreditation, prospects for gainful employment and so on. But a transformative educational process with its emphasis on critical disclosure, back to Ramsey, where the penny drops, where the heart misses a beat, that stresses the emancipatory component of this process, the freeing up. So under the heading of application, I want first to touch on the work of the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, in the introduction to Freire's most famous book, Pedagogy for the Oppressed, Richard Shaw says there is no such thing as a neutral education process. That was written way back in 1972. And that's the clue to Freire's method. No such thing as a neutral education process. Much of the time, Freire worked with illiterate poor people and he encouraged them to think critically about the words that they used was a process he called conscientization. Ugly word, isn't it? Conscientization. Enabling learners to become more aware of social, political and economic contradictions that would free them up, give them a new sense of self, a new hope. It's a way of breaking the silence of the oppressors. And Freire said this, the naming of the world, he implied, which is an act of creation and recreation, is not possible if it is not infused with love. Now, having just returned from Cuba, it's worth noting at this point in the book that Freire quotes Che Guevara. Let me say, with the risk of appearing ridiculous, that the true revolutionary is guided by strong feelings of love. It is impossible to think of an authentic revolutionary without this quality. So for Freire, 
learners are no longer regarded as containers to be filled. A process where information is transferred from the teacher to the learner, who, and the learner then puts it in the bank for safekeeping. Perhaps not, it's a not very good illustration these days, is it? Yes. About putting things in the bank. But you'll get the idea that, that you, know, you bank up your, your um, knowledge and you keep it for, for yourself. But Freire was saying instead, learners become increasingly conscious not only of how they have been moulded by their social context, but also of their ability to change it. And that theme of silence, where we feel, we feel cowed um, by the oppressors, by which he indicated that sort of muteness that overcomes people when they're faced with the overwhelming pressure of oppressive forces. Now that, of course, is closely identified with the liberation agenda of Latin America. But we completely miss the point if we think, therefore, it doesn't apply to North America or to, uh, to uh, a European context. Because I would want to argue very strongly that perhaps the, the idea of the overwhelming pressure to conform uh, in our society is less blatant, but it may be uh, more sinister because it is covert. For example, Bourdieu and Passeron in France aim to show how the dominant interests of the existing social system are concealed in the symbolic power of information transmitted by educational institutions. It is what Bourdieu and Passeron called the reproduction of cultural capital. And the great weight placed on ed educational accreditation and the prominence given to the acquisition of marketable competences reveals how powerful that process can be. There is a risk here that education itself becomes a commodity, that it may forfeit its independence, its essential critical faculty, and no longer be in a position to criticise the system that has in fact taken it prisoner. And this deception, this false Consciousness pervades, I suggest, a great deal of our public life. False consciousness is the state that occurs when there is a failure to see through things. Uh, it was Michael Williams, who was at one time um, the principal of the Northern Ordination course, uh, told me that was his way of talking about um, thinking critically. He said, yeah, let's use the words seeing through things. It's being able to see through things, to, to, to think critically. Um, and when we fail to do that, we don't see things as they really are, and we confuse them with how they appear in isolation. So the technical term for that is false consciousness. And when the outward comforts of a rich society, the world of advertising, celebrity and entertainment, for example, when... when those comforts reinforce our undisturbed assumptions, then a dose of reality is often met with fierce resistance. When, for example, some years ago now, Christian Aid carried out some research in UK churches, it found that raising awareness of the structural causes of poverty was met in the churches with considerable resistance. The masterly exposure of false consciousness by the Frankfurt School philosoph philosophers between the two world wars in Germany and then continued in the United States powerfully, to me, exposes this illusory world of commodification. And if you go into Waterstone's books, one of the books, like the Manchester one, and look at the philosophy shelves, there's a great chunk on the Frankfurt School. And you think, hmm, this is interesting, all these years later. It's because their ideas are so powerful in terms of a critique of the kind of society in which we live now. For example, uh, Walter Benjamin's unfinished arcades project, unfinished because he died escaping from the Nazis on the French-Spanish border in 1940. <clears throat> uh, his unfinished arcades project illustrated how commodities and social relations are shrouded in illusion. And he used the original Parisian arcades 
uh, to illustrate his theory that, and he and he described the arcades uh, as a kind of underworld, uh, idle wanderings through a primeval landscape of consumption where fashion is the tireless agent. And another member of the uh, Frankfurt School, Siegfried Krakauer. Uh, spoke of cinematic images on display in what he called distraction palaces. I love that. When you go to the cinema, you go to a distraction palace. Uh, and he described it as the daydreams of society. I think we can all identify with that. The Great Escape, I think it says, when you go to the cinema, doesn't it, very often. And the present popularity of these philosophers in the face of unbridled market forces and corruptions within the banking industry illustrates how important it is for Christian people uh, to reach beyond the comfort of their ideological enclosure locked into their churches to embrace the public realm that shapes our lives. And we should try to equip people, I suggest, to think critically about how, for example, large communication conglomerates select information for media transmission, how unrestrained consumption creates an aggressively competitive culture, and how bank deregulation and rapid electronic transfers of money around the world, high frequency trading, how these things, for example, conspire to limit the manoeuvrability of politicians and reinforces the power of the multinational companies. We have created a world where, to quote Adorno and Horkheimer, the leading philosophers of the, of the Frankfurt School, we have created a world where the advertising slogans for Pepsi Cola sound out above the collapse of continents. And that was back in the 1930s. Seeing through this illusory world, I believe, is an essential task for Christians wanting to speak prophetically in the public sphere. Thinking now of religion as not a sort of private thing, but a public thing. It is a double bind when the public realm sees no place for religion because it considers it to be a private matter. And when churches appear reluctant to step out of their ideological enclosure, because they would argue that socio-economic concerns uh, are either secondary or they are beyond the competence of theological discourse. And this is a prime uh, concern for Elaine, Elaine Graham, who I hope might be here tonight, but she hasn't made it. Um, she works as Professor of Practical Theology at the University of Chester. And her recent book, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, Public Theology in a Post-Secular Age, uh, tackles many of these issues and argues the case for a Christian engagement in public life. And this urgent need to think critically reminds me of a couple of stage transitions in James Fowler's faith development theory. The transition from stage three to stage four and from stage four to stage five. Let me explain. The first of those transitions is about letting go a mainly unreflective faith held in solidarity with like-minded believers and risking to move on to the stage where that individual can reflect critically on their faith commitment and re assume responsibility for the decisions that they make. The second tra transition from stage four to five takes that person to the point where they recognise that they live within a plurality of meaning systems. There are other ways of making sense of things, other religions, other philosophies. So we could argue that churches have a vested interest in keeping people at stage three, where they hold their faith in solidarity with like-minded believers. Some brave souls may move on and may even be encouraged to do so by their churches, but most will succumb to the pressure to remain for the sake of the other members. And that's one of those dilemmas. Should we stay, even though we may feel stuck in an institution that seems more concerned with money, buildings, and holding on to power, than embracing the ambiguities pres presented by other ways of making sense of things? But there is a more positive way of looking at it. Should we stay in our churches because they continue to provide 
a very important means for networking, for making connections, and for cultivating a deep sense of belonging, with, without which the postmodern world would appear very desolate. So good theological education will rightly stress the importance of scripture and tradition in the way that we make sense of things. Yet we must also engage the questions that suggest that, we, that what we presently know about our world may require a radical rethink of the philosophical constructs that once shaped our faith. This is the, the past and present um, business that I was talking about earlier. For example, the belief system, both scripture and tradition, are often dismissed as having little to say about the postmodern condition. A lot of people just don't see that it has any relevance whatsoever. Jean-Francois Lyotard put forward the idea that the collapse of the great narratives whereby we made sense of things, coupled with the replacement of the Keynesian, the, the Keynesian economic model by advanced liberal capitalism, marked the break from modernity into postmodernity. That sense of not knowing now where we're going, of living with an economic system that has betrayed us and where entertainment and unbridled consumerism tries to dispel our anxiety, has not led to a revival of religion. People no longer largely describe themselves as religious, but they do say that they are spiritual. And the confusion generated by how it feels to be alive at this time has galvanised, I think, a yearning for making sense of things that includes that sense of the ultimate reality we call God. But we can't use the traditional structures in the way that we once could. Here in this new world, science is no longer a materialistic substitute for religious faith, but is itself part of the mystery. And that suggests, I believe, that the church should be less worried about issues of doctrinal orthodoxy and more worried about how it can make connections both with those who are at the cutting edge of scientific research and those who dare to speak out against the corruption of modern society. It appears to me to be unrealistic to imagine that we will be able to turn the clock back. Movements for church growth are in danger of becoming hard line, of reinforcing ways of making sense of things that are at variance with the proliferation of ideas of which we are now aware. Okay, not all of them good and sound, but all the ways that we now think, plus the amazing reshaping of our knowledge of our universe. I don't want to be misunderstood here. I still believe that the church, particularly in its local manifestation, has an important part to play in providing places and times where people can gather to break bread and pray, where people can make links with other agencies to counter that prevailing privatised and individualistic world. I'm going to sum up very, very briefly, but those are the three main areas of understanding um, and interpretation and application. So, very briefly, transformative learning can take place when we are prepared to renegotiate our previously acquired assumptions in the light of the fusion of past and present experience. And that can be very painful. It requires Christians to tolerate ambivalence that there are other ways of making sense of life and to be available for others. The costly self-giving that we see particularly in the life and work of Jesus. It suggests that we should move away from defensive arguments about doctrine and church order to questions about justice in the light of poverty, marginalisation and oppression. It was Ernst Bloch who said, where there is hope there is religion, but where there is religion there is not always hope. And only a practical theology that starts from a critical analysis of society and which is triggered by a prophetic consciousness can resist the immense pressure to conform to the prevailing social system. And where people come together to learn by sharing their experiences, teachers and students alike can be transformed 
by the interplay of understanding, interpretation and application of knowledge. Christians, along with other people who share this kind of learning journal, because obviously it's nothing particularly to do with Christianity, might well describe their task of, of one of, quote, waking the world from its dream about itself. That's Karl Marx. Waking the world from its dream about itself. And surely that's not a million miles from the Advisory Council for the Church's Ministry Paper of 1987, which said this, mine with this quote, the ministry of the Church is to serve the mission of God in the world, proclaiming and realising God's creative and redemptive activity for the world. And transformative learning, I believe, has a significant part to play in such a process. Thank you.